um, and, intro and introduce our speaker for tonight, who is Derek Larson. So thank you so much, Derek, for coming and joining us tonight. Um, Derek is the collection manager and researcher in paleontology at the Royal BC Museum. He completed his Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science degrees at the University of Alberta, where he worked with Dr. Philip Curry. He worked on a PhD at the University of Toronto with Dr. David Evans. For several years, he was the assistant curator at the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum near Grand Prairie, Alberta. His research focus has varied between studying fossil turtles and other mesovertebrates and studying the tooth shape and ecology of theropod dinosaurs and modern monitor lizards. So thank you so much, Derek, and I'm gonna pass it over to you. All right, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much to the uh, uh, Victoria Natural History Society for inviting me to, uh, to give this presentation. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. Hooray, awesome. Uh, so yeah, I, this presentation is uh, sort of a summary of a bunch of different things that I've been working on, all involving uh, fossil turtles in the uh, uh, Cretaceous of Western Canada. So uh, I th we think we're going to hold questions till the end, but if anybody has any questions, I can talk about these sorts of things for extensive periods of time. So I'm always happy to do that. And uh, I'll just give you a uh, summary of sort of fossil turtles in general, and then we're going to get right into some of the specifics of some of the fossils that we've been finding in Alberta and BC over the last few years. So let's get into it. Yeah. How do I advance here? Um, oh, there we go. It's just taking a second. All right. So uh, I do want to do a territorial acknowledgement. I want to uh, highlight that the Royal BC Museum is located on the traditional uh, territories of the Lekwungen uh, speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And the fossils that you will see in this presentation were collected from Treaty 8 territories, as well as the traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to live and work on these territories. So let's talk about turtle diversity. A lot of people uh, might like turtles or appreciate turtles and not realize really uh, the length uh, that turtles have gone to really diversify in our modern uh, age. So we've got all sorts of different species of turtles living in all sorts of different environments from the marine turtles like the, the that are living or that are pictured here there in the middle uh, to pond turtles like the one on the left. We've got soft shell turtles like the one on the bottom right corner. And we've got very large um, land dwelling, not swimming at all really, uh, tortoises like we have in the, the top right. And there's uh, even more diversity than that, but that's a, just a good sort of smattering of things. So you can actually see, even though all turtles look like turtles, you know, they have a shell, they have four legs, they have a head and a beak uh, and a tail. Um, they still have diversified into a, a lot of different areas in which they live. So, uh, and they have also specialized in terms of, of what they're eating as well and, and really diversified their ecology. So there's a lot of diversity there. And uh, when you look at the fossil record of turtles, you realize that the turtles have actually been diversifying for as long as, as there's been dinosaurs. So uh, we've got an example there of, of sort of face-to-face -face meeting between a dinosaur and a turtle. Uh, and on the right, there's a, a reconstruction of uh, Proganochiles, the first turtle, is, which is known from the Triassic period. And uh, uh, the earliest turtles and their close relatives were evolving basically alongside the first dinosaurs that existed in the fossil record. So uh, they were very much um, evolving in tandem. And then you got the evolution of some of the modern groups of turtles, the modern families of turtles, uh, all the way back into the Cretaceous. And in fact, turtles uh, are noted as sort of one of the big survivors across the, the KT extinction or the KPG mass extinction, the mass extinction that um, uh, caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and ammonites and uh, all of those things that so characterized the Mesozoic era. 
So we're going to look a little bit at the turtle family tree. So uh, modern turtles um, have, uh, like I said, a lot of diversity. Um, their relationships between each other, between the different families is pretty, pretty well established. Uh, so notably, uh, you've got within the, the turtles or testudines, uh, you've got the uh, uh, Pleurodeers are the side neck turtles. You also have the cryptodeers, which are the hidden neck turtles. Uh, those are the sort of your, your two major lineages of, of turtles. Uh, I'm not going to talk any more about uh, uh, Pleurodeers during this, this conversation, uh, but we're going to concentrate within the, the cryptodera here. Uh, and you can see there's a large number of families around today. And if you compare that to what exists in North America today, you can see we've got a pretty good covering of modern turtle diversity in North America. Basically, a lot of the, the different turtle groups that uh, are around today uh, live in North America. But if you compare that then to the fossil record, um, what you will see is that there is actually uh, a lot of groups and a lot of diversity in the fossil record of entirely extinct lineages. Um, so you've got groups that were very successful in their time, evolved a ton of different species and were, were worldwide sometimes in, in scope. Um, uh, or, or at least, you know, uh, covered a, an entire continent uh, and then went extinct subsequently. And this presentation is going to focus on five families of turtles that are known from the Cretaceous of Western Canada. So here we've got, uh, if you look on the right, we've got our trionicids, which are the uh, softshell turtles. That family is still alive today uh, and is very successful. We've got the chelydrids, which are the snapping turtles, uh, another uh, successful group that's still alive today. And then we're going to focus on three fossil groups as well. We're going to look at the protostegids. These are marine turtles that sort of fall outside of modern marine turtles. So they still have flippers, um, they still have a reduced shell, but they're not within the diversity of, of modern uh, sea turtles. Uh, and then we're also going to look at the bayanids, and the bayanids are a, a North American endemic fossil species, and they are filling the niche of sort of the pond turtles uh, do today. So they live in rivers and lakes. Um, they're relatively um, small bodied, small to mid bodied with a, a, a relatively flattened shell, good swimmers, but not to the extent that you would see in a, uh, in a sea turtle. And then we're going to look at helochelydrids. And helochelydrids are a very interesting group. They're very, very early branching in the fossil uh, turtle family tree. If you look, this is the, the, the tree on the right, the fa family tree on the right basically shows uh, all of fossil turtle diversity. It's, it's obviously not, it, it doesn't include all of the species, but it shows all the way back to Proganochiles, the first turtle, uh, and then all the way up to, to modern groups. And, and helichelydrids are really, really close, closely branching to, to that base. Uh, so they're, they're a very strange group and they're not very well known uh, in, the, in the fossil record. So which for reasons we'll get into uh, later on, but we'll talk about that. So uh, going to move now to sort of my first section of uh, the, some of the research that I've done uh, looking at fossil turtles from northern Alberta. So we've known about fossil turtles in Alberta itself for a very long time. We've been recovering uh, fossils of Cretaceous age, so that is sort of the last period of the Mesozoic uh, before the end uh, uh, Cretaceous extinction. Uh, we've been collecting those fossils for over 100 years now from Alberta, but there's been relatively little work done uh, in northern Alberta. So this what I'm showing you now is a, a paleo reconstruction of the continent of North America. Uh, you might notice that there are some differences. Uh, for, for instance, you might notice that there's a large seaway, that big looping line in the center that actually covers much of central North America during that time. This is uh, from 71 to 77 million years ago, roughly. Uh, and if you want to compare this sort of some localities, the number of localities there uh, uh, 
five is Montana, uh, six is Southern Alberta, and seven in this case is actually Northern Alberta. And uh, if you compare that to your paleo latitudes, how the continents have been moving around slowly with continental drift, you'll actually see that at the time we are north of 60 degrees latitude. So it's actually a very Northern locality at that point. North America was further north during the Cretaceous than it is now. So it's a very interesting location to find fossil turtles. And up until a few years ago, we really didn't find much. It seemed that they were living in Southern Alberta, but sort of disappeared in Northern Alberta, which is not surprising. Uh, turtles, by and large, are cold-blooded animals, if you will. So they, they are sort of dependent on uh, ambient temperatures in the atmosphere in order to live in a particular environment. And so the further north you go, the colder that you go. Uh, it was a little bit warmer in the Cretaceous, but you'd still have a northern limit to how far turtles could live before they, it, the temperature just wasn't warm enough for them to survive. So it's a very interesting time to be looking at northern turtles. Here's a geologic uh, cross-section uh, across Alberta and Montana. And so we're gonna be focusing, if you notice on the, the far left, the north central uh, Alberta, and we're mostly gonna be concentrating around units three and four of what's called the Wapiti Formation. And this formation, uh, it, the period we're gonna be looking at stretches from 70, 71 to 77 million years ago uh, and, and corresponds very nicely actually to some of the, the great uh, dinosaur bearing units in Southern Alberta. So if you go slightly to the right, you can see in uh, Southern Alberta, uh, you've got the um, uh, Horseshoe Canyon and Dinosaur Park formations. So uh, that those units are where you find basically almost all of the dinosaurs in Alberta. So we're at that same age, but we're further north. And the, this is just a highlight as well, you know, how, how north we are. This is sort of a, a, uh, an online tool for reconstructing a paleo latitude at a particular spot. And so we're looking at somewhere between uh, 60 and 65 uh, degrees north latitude at that time. So here are the localities uh, around the Grand Prairie area. You can see Grand Prairie and uh, most of the localities uh, like in BC uh, in, in Northern Alberta are, are very much reliant on, on waterways that are cutting into the rock and, and causing exposure. So we're, we're very reliant on those. So we've got the waterways marked there with some of our localities. And on the right, you can see the geology, the stratigraphic section where we find um, uh, these localities. So we've got in space and in time. Uh, and you can see that we've got uh, fossil localities extending. We've got a one in unit one, one in unit two, a lot in unit three of the Wapiti formation, and then a couple more in unit four. So these are all sort of around the 73 million year uh, mark. But like I said, it does range from, from 78 to 71 million years. And our most productive site is a site that's highlighted in red there and it's called the DC bone bed. Uh, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the DC bone bed. So uh, DC bone bed stands for dinosaur Chelonian bone bed. So that probably tells you a little bit about what you find at this site. You find dinosaurs and you find turtles. Uh, so it's a multi-taxic mesovertebrate bone bed. And what that means is, is that you've got um, uh, a lot of uh, species that's multi-taxic and mesovertebrate in this case uh, means uh, basically a, a, a middle vertebrate. It's, it's not a very scientifically uh, defined term, but uh, you've got um, uh, things like dinosaurs that are commonly considered macrovertebrates or, or the megafauna, if you will. Uh, and then you've got very small animals like lizards and salamanders and some species of fish and uh, mammals at that time were very small that you would call microvertebrates. And in between that, in sort of the turtle to crocodile range of size and also some small dinosaurs get in there, you've got the mesovertebrate. So that's what we call a mesovertebrate for you, those of you wondering what that is. Uh, 
Uh, and so far at this site, we've recovered roughly uh, uh, 40 uh, turtle elements, and we've got uh, probably five taxa uh, just of turtles in three separate families from the site. So uh, that's very exciting, as well as the first uh, turtle skulls reported from northern Alberta, and we've got two of them. So that's very exciting. So I'm gonna go over uh, some of these things now. So first we're gonna go into the bayonets. And as I mentioned, these are these sort of pond turtle uh, like animals, but they, they sort of exist outside of the, the modern turtle radiation. Uh, and here is the skull of Plesiobana antiqua. So this is a fossil turtle uh, that is well known in southern Alberta, but like I said, this is the first, one of the first skulls that's been documented from northern Alberta. You can see it has a very uh, broad triangular skull. You can see from the top uh, view and, and the uh, underneath view, it's sort of triangular in shape. Uh, you can see the eye opening. Uh, if you look from the side, the left lateral side, you can see the eye opening there. Or from the front, you can sort of see the eye staring at you from the anterior view. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a nice skull and it's got some few features that we can help identify it as as uh, plesiobana so uh it's a little bit crushed and hard to make out but you can see a few features one is you've got this huge uh what's called an imagination so it's a big sort of semicircular space for the jaw muscles on the back of the skull. Uh, and that's very deep in uh, plesiobana so that's very typical and then it also has a um, a, uh, a sagittal ridge that comes to this very distinct point. And so that is also quite distinctive of Plesiobana relative to some of its other uh, uh, relatives. Sometimes that point gets rounded, sometimes it's more uh, extended, but in, in Plesiobana, it looks just like that. And the other feature as well is uh, the pterygoids, which are two bones of the roof of the mouth, uh, have an extensive contact. And that's what you can see there on the right. You've got an extensive contact between these two um, palate bones. So those are some of the features that we've used to identify this. And, and finding fossil skulls of turtles is really the best thing to do because a lot of very fine scale anatomy is preserved in a skull. And so it's a great thing to find to really nail down an identification. As you'll see later on, um, there are some issues when you just find a shell um, in terms of demonstrating whether or not you've got a new species or not. But we do have shell elements as well. These are, are some of the isolated pieces, but uh, due to the patterns on the shells, because uh, as you may be familiar, turtles, they do have uh, bony, er, bony plates that make up the shell, but as well, they have sort of scale-like scoots that cover them. And so based on the pattern of those scoots, you can actually tell exactly where some of these bones of the shell come from. So we've got the costals, the, the the pieces of the shell that are over the ribs, uh, as well as the uh, the neurals, which are the uh, parts of the shell that are right along the midline. They're right above, above the vertebrae or the backbone. And as well, we have part of the plastron as well. So um, uh, this is a... Uh, um, uh, the plastron is the lower part of the shell, and so this actually would have had uh, the area, you can see here, the, the notch of where the forelimb for would have sort of come out from under, from the side of the shell. So our second major group that we have at the site are the trionicids, the soft shell turtles. And so soft shell turtles, um, are very difficult to identify to species um, because softshell turtles have looked like softshell turtles for a very, very long time. Throughout all of the Cretaceous, they look very, very similar to modern groups. In fact, uh, originally uh, identifications of softshell turtles actually put uh, referred Cretaceous taxa to modern genera. Uh, so they would just literally take whatever the modern taxon was and the closest thing they, they identified the Cretaceous ones as that. So we now know that that's not true. They have evolved a little bit since the Cretaceous, but it's remarkably how consistent the mor morphology of a soft shell turtle uh, has, uh, has remained constant since then. But we've got a couple of features here. So here we've got a skull roof 
and that's the sort of figured next to a, a complete skull uh, on the, the left hand side, which sort of shows you the complete skull. You've got this is from the top view. You can see a couple of eyes. You can see the nose at the top. You can see a very extensive um, uh, sagittal ridge there. And so uh, that's very typical for, for your um, softshell turtles. They kind of have very, very unique skulls and very unique faces for, for turtles. You might notice they, yeah, they have a bit of a, a little snout at the front that they uh, are very adept at, at capturing prey with. So, uh, but we've got a couple of features here, one of which is that uh, you've got on the prefrontals, uh, this sort of midline prong that sort of sticks out at the front, and that's what that arrow is pointing out, which seems to indicate that we've got, in fact, uh, Axistemis uh, splendida which is the large uh, trionicid that lives in Alberta during this time period. We've got uh, Axistemi splendida from Southern Alberta as well. So it would make sense if it were up here as well. So it looks very consistent with that. But we also have another trionicid as well. And this one's a little bit uh, less well understood, but it is recognized by the sort of pattern on the shell. So trionicids have this very distinctive um, uh, sort of pitting pattern on the on the shell. And so you've got sort of these anastomosing ridges of bone that sort of go all over the shell with these pits in between. And uh, a one particular species, Aspiratoides foveatus, uh, has sort of pits that along the margins of the shell sort of turn into these little channels, these almost little like concentric rings. And you can see that a little bit on the image on the left. So those are the costals that are all along the back edge of the shell. And you can see that some of those pits have sort of merged together. It's like if you, in an Excel spreadsheet where you've sort of highlighted a number of cells and sort of merged them all together is what that looks like. And that's characteristic for this particular particular species. So um, yeah, we've got that that uh, taxon uh, from the site as well. And this this species is actually quite a bit smaller than uh, Axistemi splendida. So it's a it's a small body trinicate turtle. We, it's not a juvenile or anything like that. They from all sizes from hatchlings to the very largest shells we have of this thing, they they only get about half the size of a of an Axistemis. And then we've got to sort of an indeterminate uh, part of the plastron of a trionicid as well. Uh, this could be Axistemis. Uh, you really can't say from just this one element. It's probably not uh, Aspiratoides foveatus, um, but we're not 100% certain because as I mentioned before, if you just have the shell, sometimes elements of very closely related species can't be told apart. And so that's one of the problems when you're dealing with fragmentary remains. If you don't have the exact right bone to make your identification, um, there's only so far that your identifications can go because as I mentioned, uh, softshell turtles are very conservative in mor their morphology. So a softshell turtle looks like a softshell turtle throughout 99% of its skeleton. And it's just the few features that sort of differentiate them uh, to tell apart morphologically. The, I'm sure the soft shell turtles can tell each other apart fine, but uh, <laughs> as humans, not, not so much. Um, here's an exciting one. So we've also got at the site, our sort of third major taxon at the site are cholydrids, the snapping turtles, and they're quite distinctive. And so um, the, the fossil record of snapping turtles is very fragmentary. You never find a complete shell because actually, it, despite the fact that, that snapping turtles sort of have a, a bad reputation for being sort of mean, tough turtles, you know, they, they, they are known to snap, so they, their name is very apt, uh, but their shells are actually quite a bit reduced. Their, their plastron and their carapace are not terribly bony. And so when, the snapping turtles actually fossilize, their shells tend to disarticulate as opposed to a bayanid, uh, which are known to really solidly fuse their shells. The, the shell of a bayanid uh, very seldom uh, falls apart once the, the elements are fused together. Snapping turtle shells fall apart all the time. So that's very hard to find them in the fossil record. Interestingly, uh, here in Northern Alberta, it seems to be very common. We've only got these three families and uh, trilidrids are, are 
almost as common as the trinicids and the bayonet material up there, which is very strange. In Southern Alberta, you don't have that them being that common. It's also It also seems that chelydrids actually evolved during the Cretaceous. So here we could actually be seeing some of the earliest members of snapping turtles, and it might indicate actually that they that their origin is as a northern North American species. I should mention as well, our, my red arrows here are just highlighting some of the features of how you can tell it's a it's a it's a snapping turtle. So they have this very distinctive. This is a peripheral element, so it's a piece from the outside of the shell. And you might notice that there's this series of ridges that are running sort of perpendicular to the uh, one of the grooves that's on the shell. And that's very indicative of a, uh, of a uh, chelider. There's a very unique sculpturing pattern that you see in, in snapping turtles. They also tend to have really deep sulci. I mentioned the, uh, the uh, scales that are sort of uh, stuck to the surface of the shells that produce these sort of patterns, these geometric patterns. Well, those geometric pa patterns are ca caused by sulci, liter literally little, little, um, uh, little channels that are sort of running all over the bone. And they're very, very deep in, in chelydrids, deeper more so than a lot of other turtles. So those are a couple of the features that we're referring to here. But these snapping turtles, they're not very big either. They're about the same size as Aspiratoides foveatus. So the only real big turtle that we have is uh, the one species of, of trionicid. We're missing a lot of the big bodied turtles from Southern Alberta. We don't have a tortoise equivalent, which in uh, Alberta, uh, at the time is an animal called Basilemis, which is very large bodied. Um, and and uh, yeah, we're missing uh, a lot of the big bayonids. So there's some big species of bayonids that are um, about twice as big as Plesioban, and we just don't get them. We, we get these smaller turtles in, in Northern Alberta, which is interesting. Um, here's how, how the diversity of the other sites, well, BC Bone Bed, as well as some of our other sites in our area sort of stack up. So we've got uh, uh, lots of specimens from the DC bone bed and then a smattering of specimens from a, a number of other sites. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is very significant because before 10 years ago, uh, people just said that, oh, there are no turtles in, in Northern Alberta. They just don't exist. But now we have a number of different sites and they're all through the section. They are unequivocally in Northern Alberta. Um, but as I mentioned, it's really interesting. Um, they're probably smaller than their, their uh, southern relatives. And that actually makes sense because they're being endothermic animals. Uh, body size in uh, cold-blooded animals is related to, to body size. And, and the, basically, the warmer temperatures you have, the, the more that these uh, vertebrates can grow. And so when you have colder temperatures, you would expect to have smaller endotherms like this. So that's something very exciting that we can actually tell about the different climatic differences between northern and southern Alberta. So my conclusions for this section, um, we've got a, a, a wapiti turtle uh, formation assemblage is more diverse than previously sought, given the, the northern, northerly paleo latitude. There's notably absent taxa compared to the more southern assemblages. Um, they're all small, with the exception of axistemis, and even axistemis is not, it's not nearly as big as a, uh, as a basilemis, but it is a, a relatively large body um, a soft shell turtle. And as well, we've got some of the oldest snapping turtles that are known, uh, which are locally quite abundant, which I think is very significant. All right, moving on to my next section, fossil turtles in British Columbia. So as you, as I alluded to before, we've got turtles from a wide variety of different uh, environments. So uh, a lot of the um, fossil turtle remains that have been found in BC, um, I'm going to focus exclusively on some of the fossils of, from the Nanaimo group for this section, uh, have been uh, deposited in marine environments. And of course, marine turtles are quite, quite a bit different than terrestrial turtles. They have flippers rather than legs um, and, uh, a number of other features that enable them to live in, in salt water as opposed to fresh water. Um, but their closest relatives in the fossil record during the Cretaceous anyways, uh, were sometimes very impressive. So this is a, uh, a big, uh, uh, 
at least it's a protostega. Uh, so we've got two big uh, uh, fossil sea turtles, protostega and archelon. Uh, and these went to tremendous sizes, but they're not within the modern radiation of sea turtles. They're outside of that group. They, they seem to be sort of related to them, or at least in some way, there's a little bit of a disagreement in terms of how exactly they're related to modern sea turtles. But it, it seems that the modern sea turtles actually diversified in the Miocene, so after the KPG extinction by quite a bit. Um, but we're gonna be looking at a few different uh, sites to, uh, that from the Nanaimo group that I've been, um, looking at material from recently. So we've got uh, one site uh, from the Trent River uh, and then two uh, fossil sites along the Pumledge River, which is of course uh, just outside of Courtney, BC. Give you a little bit of the geology uh, context. Um, all three of these sites are from what's known as the Haslam Formation. So they're about 84 and a half million years old. So we're dealing with rocks that are about a about 10 million years older than the fossils I was just describing from Northern Alberta. Um, and these, this unit is predominantly marine, um, but as you'll see in a moment, there certainly are some terrestrial influences in part of it as well. So that's very interesting. So we're gonna look at the Trent River site. So this is actually a hemotrilhydrid. Uh, which I talked about earlier, that's this very primitive looking, sort of very early branching lineage of fossil turtles. Um, you can see sort of a complete shell uh, that's down on the right. You can see it's a pretty massive shell. It's got this very deep emargination uh, at the front. So that's where the, the neck actually would be. It's quite distinctive for the group. But the most distinctive thing is actually the shell ornamentation. This is a very weird uh, turtle for shell ornamentation. And we can actually see an SEM in the top right of your screen there. The, the ornamentation is basically these bulbous, almost like cylindrical, bulbs that sort of stick out of the surface. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see. I've sort of tried to zoom in on, on the picture here to, so you can really see what it looks like. But but the SEM really shows you just how sort of bulbous these, these protrusions are. It's completely distinctive and not like any other type of turtle ornamentation. It's very distinctive. And it, and, and it occurs in all members of this family, all members of the Helichelydridae. Uh, here's a reconstruction uh, of the specimen that we have. So you can see uh, it is missing the front part of the shell, but it's basically the back part of the carapace or the top shell. And most, about 80% of the plastron or underside of the shell. And so it's really interesting uh, when you sort of compare helochelydrids um, to other species. So here's a, a map, and this was highlighted by Joyce in 2011. Uh, you've got Europe and North America, which is the two places where you find Helichelydrids. Um, they are sort of well documented in the early Cretaceous and the early late Cretaceous, extending all the way up to the Maastrichtian, um, but uh, they're only in, in France. Um, but, uh, and there's purported evidence of them as well, stretching back all the way to the Jurassic. But you've got all of the North American species lumped together uh, under a single name, Niomicelli speciosa. And the reason for, for that is that the name taxon, uh, which comes from uh, the Aptian cloverly formation, uh, is was for the longest time the only good skeleton of a helichelydrid in North America. And so it had a name. And then all of the rest of the material, or most of the rest of the material, is just partial pieces of shell. Sometimes you'll get an element of a shell, um, but most often, more often than not, you just get a fragment of a shell. And these are another turtle, actually, that seems to seems to like to break apart rather than get fossilized, which is a bit frustrating for paleontologists. But uh, so it's very likely that we have more than a single species in all of North America, especially with the, the well-documented multiple species that there are in Europe that are extending through this whole time period as well during the early and late Cretaceous. So we likely um, have a different species um, from the Trent River site, um, but uh, we haven't 
finished writing that up yet, so so time will tell on that. But it, it's it's very very likely that there's more than just a single species in North America. All right, going to look at the punchlet site. So this is what I was talking about uh, before about how we had these very very large sea turtles that were living. Um, uh, around this time uh, in the Cretaceous. And you can see that uh, Archelon and Protostegger are, are the two largest, living about 80 and 90 million years ago. And a lot of their relatives, including what we're going to look at next, um, are still relatively large turtles, uh, but much smaller, about half the size um, or 60% or of the size of uh, of the, the very largest members. But these were just colossal sea turtles that were living uh, at that time. And this was a family called the Protostegidae. Um, and so this material, the material that was described at, at the first Puntlet site was actually just described by Betsy Nichols back in 1992. And it was referred to uh, Desmatic Healy CF Loi uh, and is known from uh, a handful of material. There's a, uh, a limb element. There is a hip element. There are a couple of pieces of the shell in the bottom right hand corner. Those are peripheral elements. And then we've got a partial lower jaw. Uh, and that is all that has really been known about this particular taxon from this area. You can compare it to other desmatic Achilles. Um, so here's a, a more complete skull. Uh, this one is from, uh, I believe it's South America, if I recall correctly, uh, a, a protostegid from a, a little bit uh, earlier in time. Uh, but you can see it's, it's a very typical of sort of sea turtle morphology. Uh, it's got a very pronounced beak. These are, are pretty um, blade-like beaks. They're active predators. They, uh, they uh, pursue a, an awful lot of their prey. Um, but um, you look at their shells and it's sort of a notable distinction of the, uh, the shell of protostegids is, is they're really quite smooth. It doesn't have any of the ornamentation that you would expect to see on the other turtle that we found in this unit, uh, which is a, uh, the helichelydrid. So very di distinct shell ornamentation there. I should also mention as well, helichelydrids, I forgot to mention, uh, they are sort of also filling this sort of large body tortoise-like shape. So they are a land-dwelling turtle. So it's kind of a little bit interesting to find them in what's predominantly a marine unit um, where, where they would normally be found on land. So that's kind of an interesting thing as well. So uh, those are protostegids. I should also note as well that um, there's been a lot of that work that's been done on protostegids since uh, Betsy's original description back in the 90s. And if you look actually at the sort of distribution of these guys, uh, Desmatic Healy's actually really more often occurs, we've got an early Cretaceous one, uh, which I showed earlier from Columbia, uh, that's Beremian to Aptian. Uh, the Desmatic Healy's low eye is well known from the Cenomanian and Tyronean. And then we actually have uh, a Mexican as well as a uh, Vancouver Island specimen uh, from the Campanian or San the San Santonian to Campanian. Um, and notably, so if you look on this map and you sort of ignore where the five is, uh, if you know much about the geology of British Columbia, you'll know that Vancouver Island has actually been slowly making its way northward. So during the late Cretaceous, when these things were swimming around, these beds were actually deposited in the, near the latitude of, um, of Baja, California. So uh, it's actually very close geographically to the other Campanian desmatic Achilles um, that, that are known, but it, there's actually a fair amount of separation. There's, there's 15 million years separation between desmatic Achilles loi and where we're finding this material. So it's likely probably not the same species as well. We just haven't found enough of it yet to really make that comparison. And so that brings me sort of to the, the last part of my talk, which is highlighting some recent field work that I did. And uh, on the call, uh, you, you uh, might see uh, um, uh, living fossil, uh, Russ Ball, who's a uh, shout out to Russ, hi. Uh, he was the one I've got to thank for finding this specimen. Um, and uh, this is some of the work that we did earlier this year. So here we are at the site. 
Um, want to give a big shout out to, to as I said, Russ, but also uh, uh, Dan Bowie, uh, Dan Bowen, uh, Nancy uh, uh, Marak, um, and a host of volunteers that we had helping at the site. It was uh, great to uh, get that work done. And this is the fossil turtle um, after we had just sort of pulled it out of its, uh, its hole in the ground that we had dug it up from earlier this year. So this is the Pudledge River, such as it was in back in April. And uh, we're sort of excavating right along where near the water's edge, and that will sort of come into play later, but we're technically on this, this bed that's sort of right next to, to the water level. Um, we did have a, a slight delay in starting. The, the river levels were up very high uh, this spring, so it was difficult to access the site before April. And then uh, we were sort of uh, running against the, the snow melt trying to get this fossil out of the ground. Uh, so here is sort of the uh, initial um, discovery as it was in April. So, so Russ had been um, uh, prospecting along the Puntledge. He had found pieces of bone and then uh, uh, him and Dan had actually uh, evaluated the site and discovered that there was actually much more than just a single bone, which is sort of the most common thing to find. Usually you don't find a bunch of bones together. So they knew that this was a very rare site. Um, and so then they, they called down to um, the Royal BC Museum and I was happy to, to work with them to get it out of the ground. So here's how it was sort of first uncovered uh, when I got there and that's a, a geologic hammer for scale. You can see the turtle elements are a bit hard to see, but they're sort of the brown pieces of bone that are sticking out from the, the gray uh, siltstone um, that's uh, the most of the, the rock is uh, encasing it. Um, and one thing that's kind of a little bit unique about this, this fossil is that I tentatively identified it as a protostegid, but um, there is a very weird element. And unfortunately, I didn't get a really great picture of it before we, uh, we collected it, but I highlighted in red here, uh, there is a piece of the shell uh, that does have some pretty interesting sculpturing and it doesn't seem to match either the terrestrial uh, Helichelydrid, Nioma kelly's, that um, has been found earlier, and it doesn't match what you would expect for a protostegid as well. So it is definitely a turtle shell, um, and it's definitely from a marine environment, but uh, the jury is out in terms of whether or not it is a desmatic helis or something potentially different, which would be very exciting. So here is uh, the progress of the excavation going on. We'll show you a little bit of a time lapse here. This is us just sort of in, in the course of a morning sort of clearing off part of the site. The rock slowly drying out and getting getting exposed. So it was a bit slow going. We wanted to make sure that we had completely uncovered the site and we weren't missing any sort of crumbly bits of bone. We wanted to make sure that we were doing our due diligence and being very careful to get it properly collected. I need to advance the slide for me. There you go. And so here is the um, turtle just before we jacketed it. So you can see we've done all the way around it. Uh, it is largely still encased with rock, but I'm going to highlight a few things. There's the geologic hammer for scale again. This is sort of the initial part that was exposed in my previous picture. So you can actually see that the, the turtle um, site was a lot more extensive than sort of was previously known. It's about a meter, the block is about a meter long by 50 or 60 centimeters wide, uh, but quite thin. The bone layer is actually just very much one layer of bone. Um, but it looks like we have multiple bones from the skeleton. We purposefully didn't expose a lot of it because we didn't want to damage it. The bone is actually softer than the rock that encases it. So we just basically dug around a trench and the moment we ran into bone, that's where we knew to stop. So we would apply our glues, make sure things were stabilized and then continue to sort of dig around and making this sort of pillar um, that we could, we could then excavate. And you can see here a number of the other bones that we were sort of exposing as we were chipping around. So we've got some on the top and then uh, slowly made our way all the way around uh, until we found uh, the extent of it. 
So here's some photos that we had jacketing. So we mixed up some plaster, we paper toweled the specimen, and then we put uh, burlap bandages soaked in plaster and completely encased it, sort of making almost this little mushroom jacket um, with sort of just the, the base of the pillar underneath the fossil. And then the water levels came up a little bit, um, but we were able to manage to get the, the fossil out by uh, sheer force of will. Uh, we had two people shoveling and two people bailing water out of our, out of our trench. And, uh, and then we got the, the pedestal broken and then flipped over. And, uh, and that's where you see us now. It's a very, very happy group uh, to get our, our fossil out of, the, out of the hole there. And then uh, we, we capped it with plaster and then brought it, brought it back to the museum. Here, here's a picture I took the moment I got it back to, to Victoria uh, that night. And, and it uh, was sitting in our, um, our uh, our collections room that's sort of like the pre-collections room where it has to sit to make sure it doesn't have any pests and, and those sorts of things before it comes into the proper collection. So that was the, the fossil's journey. So uh, we're very excited. Like I, I, I don't have a lot of things to say other than this fossil is very intriguing. We've got lots of bones um, and some of them don't quite make any sense for an existing taxon, which is exciting, but I'm, uh, there's a lot that we don't know about it yet that's just going to have to wait until we can open up that plaster and, and start slowly chipping away until we unco can uncover all of the bones in a, in a controlled environment. So very excited about that. So as a summary, uh, we've got uh, extensive fossil turtles uh, from Western Canada, but uh, excavation in new areas are uncovering, are uncovering previously unknown diversity. We've got a ton of material that uh, is in places where people haven't found turtles before, and it's really, really exciting. Um, Fossil turtles in BC and Alberta are documenting a very interesting time in their evolutionary history where you've got the evolution of modern groups like some of the very first snapping turtles, uh, some very old uh, trionicid softshell turtles, they were first emerging and then we've got very old lineages like these, this Helochelydrid, Naoma kelly's, that is very much a, a relic of time and is sort of some of the last of its lineage of turtles uh, before they go extinct. Um, and uh, fossil turtles in BC are, are currently not well understood. Um, you know, and in the Nanaimo group, we've got possibly three different species known from three different specimens, which tells you that you're not getting a very good sample of your, your unit if you're just constantly finding new species. So I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, there's a lot of sort of great opportunities to find new fossils in the future going forward. Uh, I also wanted to mention as well, sort of a little bit of a plug. Uh, if you do happen to find a fossil and you're in BC, I'd encourage you you all, uh, there's a, a, a government form uh, with uh, Heritage Branch on, on their website. You can fill that out. You can report a fossil there. Uh, or alternatively, uh, you can just send me an email and I can I can put you in touch with the right people as well. I, I frequently uh, handle emails, you know, at least once a week that comes my way uh, of somebody thinking that they may have found something. And more often than not, it is a rock and that's fine. We want to encourage people to report stuff as often as they uh, they think they have something exciting because every once in a while, you know, you get a report and it turns out to be very significant. So uh, yeah, definitely if you think you have a fossil, uh, let us know or let Heritage Branch know and we'd be happy to move that along for you. So, so many people to thank. Uh, collaborators, um, people who found the fossils, museum collections, dig volunteers, funding sources, provincial partners, uh, the Victoria Natural History Society, uh, happy to, to be here as well. Uh, this is a very collaborative work. I've worked with a number of different individuals from a number of different institutions. Um, science doesn't happen in a vacuum and it certainly doesn't happen alone. So I have so many people to thank and I really appreciate all of the help that I've had to get this work done. Um, and thank you, that's the end of my talk.